What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the College Loop Podcast, episode 15 of the College Loop Podcast. We are now fully stocked up on guests or people today. Daniel's back to the land of the living after his birthday shenanigans. Uh, Daniel, how you doing? How's the how's the big 2-0 treating you? Oh, it's been good. You know, we've been 24, let's see, I guess about 48 hours now, and they've been pretty good. So uh, we got the big one in uh, 363 days. That's right. That's right. Do you, have, do you have a good birthday weekend, though, man? It was great. Um, great time with all my dearest friends here at Auburn University, um, especially these two right here. Big thanks to them for taking some time out of their busy schedules to um, make some time to celebrate with me. Always appreciate that. Always appreciate the Auburn family. and Always appreciate everyone who listens to the College Loop. Thank you for all the birthday wishes I got from the Twitter fam. So let's just get right on in. Look at that PR. Look at this all PR genius sports. right here. <laughs> and uh, once again, as always, Harrison Tarr to my, oh, well, to me, it'd be to my right, where's where I'm pointing, but this time he's on my left, not like last show. Tar, how you doing? I'm doing great, man. I uh, had a great little weekend down in Auburn, got to check out uh, and see in person and witness Darion Goborn walk out to God Save the Queen. Uh, got to go check out. I was there in person. We're going to talk about it. Uh, women's basketball. Up, uh, upsetting Ole Miss and, and and really pleasantly surprising, I think, everybody here. And I'm very excited to talk about that game. Um, and, and we had an opportunity to talk a little bit, and the sound quality wasn't where, where, where it should have been, so I'll, t- I'll take blame on that um, for Sunday's episode. But glad we, we got to sit down and talk a little bit about that and about, hey, how about how about Will Cruz's st- sweet streaker catching on, man? How about that? Let's go. You love to see it. You really do, and I'm pumped up to get this show on the road, Dylan. All right, well. Start off with a little men's basketball, as we do around here. Auburn is now the number 15 team in the country, which is their 31st consecutive week in the AP poll, which I believe is a, uh, let me see, the uh, program record. Program record. That's right. <laughs> and it's, here's a little fun tidbit for you. 15 in the AP poll on episode 15 of the College Loop. It's a week. And I grew up wearing number 15 in every sport I played. So we make up the nickname. We basically are the reason Auburn basketball is running right now. We come up with all the nicknames. 15th episode means 15th in the country. Let's hope it doesn't keep the trend going up. All I'm saying is if in in the tournament season, it winds up shaking out that our, our number ends in a four. The final four is no (laughs) coinkening. There's a lot of good points. Dylan, you mind if I take point and then I'm going to pat, you know, I'll pass the ball over to Daniel and then he'll, He'll he'll throw it to you if you uh, drain that deep three for the men's uh, for for football later on. Yeah, little... I'll, be, I'll be the street sweeper in this uh, in this scenario. Hey, I <laughs> love that. I love. It. Let me be the little Zeb, Zeb Jasper who Dylan and I actually ran into at Moe's Barbecue on Saturday on Sunday rather. <laughs> yep. So what a chill guy, man. I mean, just just a great dude. Loves that. There's there's a things I want to talk about. Handful of things I want to talk about um, about men's basketball. And like you said, uh, number fifteen in the AP poll uh, this week, make marking thirty one consecutive weeks program record. Guys, before we really dive into this A and M matchup, let's just take a turn, take a take a moment, take turns, go around the horn here, uh, and, and we'll start with you, Daniel. Uh, really, how much does this speak to Bruce Pearl's, I guess, building of a, of an empire on the plains, and and not just that, but but the real buy in um, of Auburn men's basketball? Because I think we all agree that it's here to stay. It is, um, you know, 31 weeks ranked in the AP poll for Auburn basketball. you got some old head Auburn fans out there. If you told them that in 2015, they would look at you, be like, what, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> and you just wouldn't give that thought at the time of day. But now here we are. Both of you came to Auburn, immediately saw the Tigers go to the Final Four, and then just – that that was just the, the beginning – um, a lot of people thought that the program had hit its peak and that things that that was just kind of a flash in the pan, a one time thing. Will they get back to a final four soon? I honestly believe so. Not this year. Don't quote me on that. But this team has the makings and the foundation to be good for many, many years to come and just keep building. But, yeah, the foundation's here. The support's here. The coaches here. The recruiting's here. And the fans are here. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, the just investment, both mentally, um, financially. financially, it's all here now. Um, everyone who you need to buy in to a program for the program, to just have the framework it needs to succeed is here. You know, the arena is not that old. Um, they're building a new basketball facility. It's just, you can bring recruits here. 
that's some trouble that I think uh, they're having on the other side of the state is that no matter what the basketball program accomplishes, it's really not being invested in. You know, the, the plans to build a new arena in Tuscaloosa were just postponed uh, again. And that's just a trend we're going to keep seeing. And that is what – that that's the great divide we're at. And I, I'm sorry to get on this soapbox here, but that's just something that's been on my mind all day. No, I, I think you bring up a great point, but I do want to throw a little credit, and this is not going to sit well with with, with Auburn fans. And, and and you know what? We need that that little little counterpoint, right? I would like to throw a little credit, credit to Alabama basketball fans um, uh, over the past two years, really. Uh, with with their continual growth and buy in, um, I I do think Nate Oates is a phenomenal basketball coach. I don't think either one of you guys will disagree with that. Um, right. I think that personally, if you ask me right now, um, I didn't release my top twenty five. I haven't this year because that tends to ruffle too many feathers for me to really want to mess with my mentions. <laughs> uh, I would have Alabama as, as my number one team um, in, in the country right now. They are just that good. Um, I would like him a lot more in Austin. I'll tell, you that. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that Texas job is looking mighty, mighty encouraging for Auburn fans. But uh, I, I do think just just to have a little parody uh, on the on this on this uh, on this podcast. I do think it's worth acknowledging the fact that what Nate Oates has done at Alabama is impressive. But unlike the ESPN announcers on Saturday, I'm not going to talk about Alabama on an Auburn centric podcast. I did want to just throw in that little caveat there. Dylan, um, Daniel just touched on the coaches there, uh, the supports there financially fan base wise student buy-in i mean th- we don't talk about how, how i mean enough how important that is and how valuable the jungle is and, and, and daniel i'm not just kissing your butt because i know you're heavily involved um you know th- how involved i was when i was uh, in, right. in, in school i wasn't on the leadership team in the jungle but i was th- i was i was there every game uh there is a ton of student buy-in it gets buzzed around the campus dylan talk for just a second and, and, and it's completely okay for us to talk about the how impressive it is what bruce pearl has accomplished here at Auburn. Yeah, if you think about the first couple of years he was here, he had to go classroom to classroom to like basically beg students to come to the games. And if you look back in the past five years, Auburn is the winningest team in the SEC over those past five years. And I think that speaks volumes of what Bruce Pearl can bring to it, any school. Uh, I know some Louisville fans out there and some Maryland fans really thought that he, he was going to bring a vibe to those schools. But uh, I believe he is a tiger for life uh, and go with the – Talk about Nate Oates for a little bit. Uh, I do believe he might be the Texas coach in a little bit, but I guess he is kind of the Nick Saban of college basketball coaches, as uh, Bama fans have said. And uh, good Lord, the Bama fans in my mentions have been wild. And uh, But, yeah, I, I think BP has really brought something to Auburn that, I mean, you brought up the old heads, that no one has ever seen this kind of run from Auburn basketball. Even if you go back to the Barkley days or the – uh, blanket on the 1999 guy, uh, book, not Booker. Going back to the Sonny Smith days. Sonny Smith days. Uh, you don't expect this, especially since we're not far along from when Auburn was a bottom feeder in the SEC. Uh, it feels like it was 20 years ago now. But now with Bruce, with what Bruce Pearl has brought here, it is outstanding. Auburn's a perennial March Madness team. We're always in the hunt for the SEC championship in, in both the regular season or the tournament. It it's amazing. And I don't think people talk enough, and, and this is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end it here. I don't think people talk enough about uh, the, the, tact- uh, the tactical placement of a self-imposed postseason ban. You know, you, you interpret that as you will. Um, I, say what you want about Bruce Pearl. Um, I really don't think he's, an, he, I, think, I actually think he's a good human. And, I, and I'm not just saying that just because I'm an Auburn alum. Uh, I, I really do think his heart's always been in the right place. Um, I, I do think he loves Auburn. I think his family loves Auburn. Um, and, and and there's really, in my opinion, there's not a better fit in the world to coach um, the Auburn basketball team uh, than Bruce Pearl. And this isn't breaking news, but 31 consecutive weeks in the AP poll setting a program record. Now is the time that the, 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 that's worth mentioning, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I wanted to talk about that. Now, let's let's pivot real quick and, 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 and talk about guys. This is an important home game on Wednesday. Um, and, and, and this, this is, this show's coming out on Tuesday. So it'll be, you know, tomorrow night, I think it's 7 PM SEC network. Maybe, um, y'all 8, can fat- 8 PM central, 8 PM central. So, oh my gosh, it's a nine game. I oh, forgot about gosh. that. That stinks. Um, and that's on, is that an ESPN game, Dylan? Do you have it in front of you? Uh, ESPN I do ESPN, ESPN two. two. ESPN yeah. two. This is a very, very big home game for Auburn. Um, for, 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 for a number of reasons. One, you want to stay undefeated in the jungle. That's a big deal. Um, uh, longest active winning streak in college basketball at this point now. Um, shout out Gonzaga um, for really just crapping the bed, but that's neither here nor there. Really, it's not. It, it goes beyond the, the home win streak, guys. This one's big for the resume. This one's big for the conference. Um, now, A and M messed around a little bit this this weekend, and they went and lost in a, in a, in a rock fight uh, in, in Rupp Arena. It was a rock fight. 
Um, but I mean, to, to that point, uh, and we'll talk about this later in the week when we, when we really start looking at this stretch that Auburn's got, and it's a gauntlet um, oh. after this game. And don't get me wrong, this is not a cupcake game at all. Uh, but this has big-time implications after a and loses to what I think is probably the best version we've seen of Kentucky this year. Uh, this is going to be the biggest test to this point in Auburn guard play. If, if, if you scout out Texas A&M, they're 5-2 and two in the conference right now. Uh, they're 13-6 and six overall. Buzz always has his team well coached. They tend to give Auburn fits. Let's not forget the last team to beat Auburn at home was Texas A&M on Auburn senior night. Had they not won that? Second ever Auburn basketball game. Was it really? I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, and let's not forget, if Auburn wins that game, this whole winning streak's even longer. Because that was the only game they lost at home all year. Unless you fact check me, I think I'm right. Um, and, and the Isaac Okoro year 2020 to 2021, um, okay, yeah. pr- prior to uh, what should have been the SEC and NCAA tournament, COVID-19, XYZ, whatever. But if you look at this just m- from a matchup standpoint, we've talked a lot recently about forward play and and, and, and the importance of Janai Broom and the importance of a big man, Dylan Cardwell, to put in valuable minutes. That still remains important. Janai Broom's coming off of what Auburn fans – hope to be the the promise of the future but let's look at Wade Taylor the fourth for a second here guys this is going to be a guard matchup that's going to be circled for Wendell Green for probably more than likely Zeb Jasper and Katie Johnson more so than anything Trey Donaldson you throw them in that in that mix um and when we talked a little bit on Sunday about uh Wendell Green's facilitating on the offensive end of the floor this is going to be important on the defensive end of the floor uh Wade Taylor the fourth averaging 14.8 points a game uh 2.8 rebounds 3.8 assists uh, he's, 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 he doesn't turn the ball over 2.4 turnovers a game. This is going to be a matchup that if Auburn is going to soundly win this game at home or win this game at home, let's not forget that they tried to crap the bed against Mississippi state last time that they were at Auburn arena. They're going to have to shut this down and it's going to start with the guard play. And this might be the most important time right before we get to this gauntlet. We'll start with Daniel um, and, and we'll rotate around like we usually do. Daniel, talk talk to me a little bit about the importance here because I think this is probably the most important matchup to get the guards ready for the gauntlet that Auburn's about to run. It is um, because the past couple games, Mississippi State's not really very strong in there. South Carolina wasn't strong anywhere. Um, so, yeah, they just haven't really faced uh, – and Texas A&M's not elite. I'm not saying that. But they haven't faced that, like, elite guard play in a very long time. So – I would say that they are, at this point, decently unprepared for what's ahead in just a little over a week in Knoxville. Not to you know, skip ahead too far. But, um, yeah, so you really need this one. Um, he's good. That – God, blank on his name. Wade Taylor's he's fourth. fourth. He, he is good. So this will be a good practice for Wendell, Zepp, KD – all of those guys hopefully get some reps with him to kind of, you know, work out those kinks. And, you know, getting a little ahead of myself here, West Virginia's got some solid guard play too. Oh, you're absolutely correct. And I was not going to skip over that. That's not a gimme game. It's, no. it's it, it should be a win for Auburn, but that's not a gimme game. They could very well lose that. Uh, Dylan, I'm interested to get your thoughts here, and, and you're welcome to comment on the guard play and beyond. Uh, I just really thought it was that this is very important. Um, Auburn's guards have gotten better. But this is going to be a good test for them because, I mean, let's face it, Buzz always has a really well recruited, uh, really well coached team. They're disciplined and they give Auburn fits. I'm interested to hear your take. Uh, so I did a little, little, did a little stat reading for my own. Uh, so last game against Kentucky, uh, every guard that attempted a shot against Texas A&M had double digit points. Just a little fun fact. And Auburn is usually good for about one or two of their guards, if you count Alan Flanagan as having double digit games. So I think it's going to be one of those big – and you bring up Wade Taylor. Yes, he's a really good. He's also averaging more points uh, on away, in away games than he is on home games. He averages three more points in away games. So that's going to be really big. Uh, I know Wendell Green is averaging 1.6 steals a game. So I got to bump those numbers up a little bit if we're going to stop him. But I, you also have to look out for – let's see. I'm tr- trying to remember his name. All the guards on this team are pretty good. Tyrese Radford, who scored 22 points against Kentucky. I got to look out. There's a lot of guards on this team that I think Zeb Jasper is going to be, ha, is going to have his hands full. Katie Johnson is going to have his hands full. There's going to be a game where we have to depend on 
All right, can Katie Johnson and Zeb Jasper, they're good defenders, but can they step it up a little offensively so we can have a little bit more scoring than just Wendell Green? And you never know which Alan Flanagan you get. I I think he's back, but again, I, at last last game, eight points, but he also put up ten rebounds. I'm like, I... let, let me talk for two seconds about Alan Flanagan, and then we're going to go around the horn. We'll go reverse this time, so Dylan, you'll get to go first uh, about about player to watch for Auburn this year, uh, this this week or on Wednesday rather. Um, Alan Flanagan. I'm confident about him being back and in, in now in, in terms of when he's not producing offensively, he's figured out how to be there defensively, how to be there on the boards, um, how, to, how to get that big dunk when he needs it. I mean, it, it was eight points, but it was, it was a very valuable eight points. Uh, th- this guy is, I mean, he's probably the third most valuable player on this team now. Um, and when, when, you, when you look at Janai Broom, you look at Wendell Green Jr. and then Jalen Williams, and then so maybe four, but, but Alan Flanagan is in that mix of these are the guys that you're going to run with. Um, now let, let's let's go around the horn here. I'm going to start start with 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 Dylan, and I'll round it out um, once we come back to the end as we get ready to pass the ball over to Daniel for a huge win for Auburn women's basketball. Uh, let's talk about Dylan. Who do Auburn fans want to see, and who does Auburn need to see a big game out of um, on 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 Wednesday night? I my heart wants me to say Leo Berman, but <laughs> I had to say Alan Flanagan. Uh, I, I, you want a do- another double digit point thing from him, another, uh, another double digit point game from him. English is a language I speak, but <laughs> that's a Harrison Tarism right there. <laughs> yes, it is. It is rubbed off on me, but yeah, Alan Flanagan is the guy you want to see scoring a lot of points this game. I, I, Wendell Green can do it all, but can he do it all is going to be how I'm going to word that. You need another guard helping him score. And Yejani Broom, he just had a big comeback story, scoring 27 points against South Carolina. I'm getting my Garnet and Maroon teams mixed up. Carolina, correct. Yeah, he just scored 27 points. But two games ago, he was scoring six and four, which I know he was still putting up semi-decent games, not like eye-popping. But you can't just depend on Janai Broom to get the points that Wendell Green can't get. And I think Alan Flanagan probably being the best three-point shooter. I know statistically it's Jalen Williams, but I think that Alan Flanagan is more – when he's hot, he's hot. Oh, he's the streakiest player on this team. So that's what I mean by that. I think Jalen Williams is probably the better because he takes better shots. But Alan Flanagan is more is closer to that. He can put up more points than Jay Will can. I think Jay Will is a little more consistent. Daniel – I'd like to get your I, – and I, I love that take, by the way, Dylan. I really do. I was just saying I just think Jay Will's a little more consistent. Daniel, love to hear your your thoughts on this. Um, who does Auburn really need to see step up on uh, on on Wednesday night? Right. <clears throat> so, KD Johnson. At some point, I would like to see 2021-2022 KD Johnson back. And in the regular season on the, the college game day game – I unfortunately wasn't there. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina with a good friend of the show, Greg's Blankenberg. Um, but Shout Katie out Greg. had a really good day that day. So that's what I'm looking for. Like it's gotta happen at some point, right? Daniel, you would think. And uh the reason I, I got all animated there for a second, I was like the Bruce Pearl, the you know what I mean? That that for those of you watching the visual prod, podcast, um, you're welcome. If you're not, you should definitely go back and watch that little clip. Um, but I was I was getting animated because you took you took my answer, um, and I had a backup answer. We're good. I have a backup answer, and I, I so obviously I agree with you. Um, big opportunity for Katie Johnson defensively, nothing else. Um, right. If if you're going to shut down the guard play, you got to at least show that you're valuable in the sense that Zep Jasper is valuable in the sense of locking down defenders, not turning the ball over, having good shot selection. Now, since you, since you mentioned Katie, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll revert to my boy Jay Will. Um, uh, Jalen Williams, and, and I've been high on him all year, and it's not just me. I mean, I everyone in this room right here understands and has understood from the beginning how important Jalen Williams is to this team. Uh, in my opinion, I think he's, uh, in large, quite possibly the most consistent, if not the most valuable player on this team outside of maybe Jani Broom. Um, Wendell Green, phenomenal, don't get me wrong, but uh, just look at where the sparks have come from, and it has been time and time again, Jalen Williams. Uh, Auburn has been plagued throughout this season with stretches where it just looks like they forget how to play offense. And then who there are three suspects that will break them out of this more often than not Jalen Williams. Uh, it, it, obviously Wendell Green's capable of doing it in, 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 in an emphatic dunk from and uh, Dylan Cardwell or Janai Broom or Alan Flanagan can do it. But Jalen Williams decision-making on the court, his ability to provide that senior leadership. He was the only player for a while against South Carolina that didn't look phased by the one, three, one. 
uh, his his ability to shoot the ball, I'm I'm expecting a, a better performance from him on Wednesday than we saw on Saturday, which not a bad performance by any stretch of the imagination, but a quiet night for Jalen Williams. A quiet, what was it 14? Uh, quiet 12. Uh, keep talking, I'll get you. Quiet 12 or 14. This is another opp- opportunity for him to really assert that, hey, I'm I'm that guy, and I, I demand uh, demand attention, demand respect from from other teams' defensive sets. Uh, so I, I think Jalen Williams has uh, has a really big opportunity on Wednesday. But I'm with you, Daniel. My one A would be Katie Johnson, um, and and I think that uh, Zeb Jasper is also in there too. Um, I think that's worth noting in terms of shutting down the guard play. Dylan, I know that you're still working on that, and that's okay. I believe oh, he, had, he, got, he had 12 points. 12 points. 12. I, I couldn't remember if it was 12 or 14. My 12 apologies. and 6. He had six rebounds, an assist, and a steal. There you go. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pivot over, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the metaphorical basketball over to Daniel Locke as he talks about, man, what an overtime thriller in Neville Arena on Sunday evening. Um, and I was sure glad that I could spend it with you, Mr. Locke. I had a great time. Let's hear about it, man. Yeah, I reciprocate that completely. Uh, one of my favorite things this year has been covering women's basketball games, um, especially the ones I've gotten to cover with Harrison. So just going to dive right into it. It started out, I thought it was going to be more of the same. Auburn was down by 14 at one point, but they never wavered. They battled all the way back. They outscored the Rebels 24-12 to in the third quarter. Um, the Rebels outscored them 17-13 to in the fourth quarter. The not the game up at 70 but in overtime, Auburn wins on a buzzer beater, and that is the loudest I've ever heard Neville Arena not for a men's basketball game. It was just a great environment. It's great to see that support for women's basketball. Um, Aisha Koulibaly with a career-high 31 points. Auburn had two other players in double figures as well. Honestly, Scott Grayson scored 11, and Marshawn Bostic scored 11. And as Coach Jay said in the post-game press conference, honestly, still not 100%. Like, she's beat up. Um, so, she could Daniel, still get even better. And Aisha Koulibaly is on fire right now. Marshawn Bostic's coming into her own. This Auburn team, I think it's realistic to see them win five conference games again. I love that. Um, I, I don't I don't actually – I really don't disagree. And and to your point about honestly, Scott Grayson, it's really important. I want to just drop this tidbit in there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say front, on the behalf of the college loop, congratulations on your thousandth career point. Um, that's yeah. huge. Um, I know it came on a free throw. You probably would like to see it from the, from, from the arc, something, something cool, but I mean, guys, that's a hell of an accomplishment. Um, that is, uh, especially in women's basketball, it's a feat. It really is. When you're a guard in women's basketball, that is a feat. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there is nobody better in the sec at getting the ball inside on her own without having to move it and, and, and spread the love as much. And she does. She's a great passer, um, has all the trust in the world in her bigs. Coach Jay said in the post game press conference, trust Aisha Koulibaly more than anyone I've ever seen trust anybody. Uh, but her ability to put the ball on the floor and not turn the ball over much, um, get to the rim, get get to the charity stripe. Uh, guys, she's going to be first or second team all SEC if she can stay healthy for the rest of the year. And like you said, She's tough as nails. At one point, I, I reached over, I actually hit Dylan on the, uh, no, she's not Dylan, Daniel on the shoulder and had to look away, Dylan, because I thought Aisha Koulibaly, I thought she'd snap, oh, no, excuse me, I thought, uh, honestly, Scott Grayson had snapped her leg. Yeah. Um, she got rolled up on and it was scary. And of course, she just pops right up and goes and sinks her thousandth career point. I, I mean, it, it, it literally, and in, in within 10 seconds of each other. Um, what if what a huge win um, for for women's women's hoops. We kind of written this one off as a loss. And you, like I said, you know, we always say you don't, Play the game if you you wouldn't play the game if you already knew who was going to win, but what a much needed victory and and you could see it in all the girls' eyes. Um, I've, I'm going to go and plug my own Twitter real quick. My favorite video I've ever taken to this team, them dancing uh, to Swag Surf and Aisha. Uh, excuse me, not Aisha. I keep wanting to call I honestly Aisha probably because Aisha dropped 31. Um, but honestly, picking up some random photographer's chair and just dancing with it was legendary. Um, Daniel. You said this team's ceiling is is is, is five uh, is is now achievable to win five games in the conference. Sure, I and I, I don't necessarily disagree. How big was this in terms of main re- retaining player buy-in going forward? Oh, huge! Um, Ethan Miller, my roommate, and I were talking about this at dinner tonight. Like it was really, really huge for this team to get them that monkey off their back, right? They've got they've just got that winless in conference play fact off their back. They don't have to worry about that anymore. They can just lock in, focus on just one game at a time, just take it step by step, and get the job done. 
I, I I completely agree. Dylan, would you like to add anything? I'm sorry. I know that Daniel and I kind of dominated this one. It was a, it was a fun one to be at. And uh, Dylan, uh, Daniel and I moved ourselves down to the floor level by Britt Bowen. So we, I could actually out of my ear, hear his, his game winning call when uh, Ole Miss won, uh, missed that buzzer beater. And man, was it electric. I was going to ask, which, what are the four games that you see the winning Daniel the next four? Um, I just had the schedule up. Let me. Well, it starts with Kentucky. I can read it out to you. I have it written down. I've got it right here. Um, it starts okay. with Kentucky on Thursday. Um, personally, I don't have that one. I have the next two after Kentucky, Florida and Arkansas. That brings you to three. Then, <laughs> excuse me, Texas A&M at home on February 16th, and then senior day against Vanderbilt. But you're saying I, we're not beating South Carolina. I don't – no. Auburn's not beating South Carolina. Nobody's beating South Carolina. <laughs> I would not be shocked if they went into Athens and, and upset Georgia. I don't um, I, I, I'm not just saying that. I, I, I would not be shocked. I think they match up well if this team stays healthy, and that's been the caveat all year. Uh, if this team stays healthy and they keep believing in themselves like they have been, it's so much of it is a mental thing. And it's, it's like when we say Katie Johnson needed to go see the ball to go through the hoop, right? It's the same concept. Uh, so I, I'm very excited for this team. Very excited for Coach J, uh, and and for that matter, I'm I'm thrilled for AC and Honesty, and everyone for that matter. But I mean, Honesty, huge accomplishment, and AC with a career 31 is not anything to sneeze at, bro. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. All right, Dylan, I know that you're itching, and uh, and we're probably gonna break this up into segmentes. So just give us a little signal whenever we need to do that. Um, yeah, I was just getting ready to text you about that. Nope, no need to. That's okay. I mean, <laughs> the people can know that sometimes we've got to break this one up because of our free Zoom recording and we refuse to pay for Zoom so far. Um, and, that, and that's okay. We're, we'll, we'll get there. We'll, uh, knock out, we'll knock out the first tidbit and then we'll do a little swappy. Hey, let's rock and roll. Let's talk some Auburn football, Dylan. Let's hear it. All right. So if you're fans of the Auburn Sports Network, you know that Andy Bertram has been the play-by-play guy for a long time uh, since the passing of the GOAT, Rod Bramblett. And his side sidekick has always been Stan White since he took over. Well, now Stan White, I believe, is retiring. Mm-hmm. And, but he's being replaced with another Auburn football legend, Mr. Jason Campbell. Yes, sir. He played at Auburn from, I believe, to, he played for 2001 to 2004. I think that's four seasons, either that or 2000. But, yeah, and uh, looking at the stat, stat sheet, uh, Campbell is second in career passing yards. Do you know who's first? Pat Sullivan. No. Yeah, that, that would have been my guess. Well, you're all going to feel really stupid because it's Stan White. Yeah. <laughs> Stan White. So, yeah, it's another little passing of the torch, uh, if you will. But, yeah, I think Jason Campbell is really going to – Here's questions. your college loop. Here's your college loop clickbait. Was there a quarterback battle for who gets to be the color commentator for Auburn, the Auburn Radio Network? <laughs> <laughs> who was on ball? Was Cam Newton? It was Chris Todd, <laughs> Brandon Cox. Some might say Cody Burns was in on clickbait, it. Clickbait, clickbait, clickbait. <laughs> Kyle Frazier is your next play-by-play guy. Some, for the some are calling this the biggest quarterback controversy in, in all of Auburn right now. <laughs> People are saying TJ Finley. <laughs> Andy Burcham has one of the best quarterback rooms we've ever seen out of anybody from Auburn athletics history. You're so not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me that man's going from Stan White to Jason Campbell. There's not a better <laughs> passing of the torch in Auburn football history than that. <laughs> in 30 years, it will be one Jarrett Stidham. <laughs> <laughs> oh my well oh god i can't wait for every game did you hey listeners did you know that jared stidham is from texas Jer- yeah. my name is former auburn my, my name is jared Stidham, former auburn quarterback i'm from texas <laughs> <laughs> all right and another news uh keldrick falk according to rivals is now a five star he has been awarded his fifth star which is actually the first five star auburn has signed since 2019 Stars being plural, uh, according to one Harrison Tarr. Uh, they signed Bo Nix and Owen Papo in 2019. And one of, I believe, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, five stars Auburn has gotten in the past decade. I don't even think I can name seven. That's eh, probably a good chance. You, you, you probably could name a couple of them. Past decade going back to 2013? Yes. Uh, let's see, Daniel. You want to help me out here? The Givens yeah. are obviously um, Derek the, Brown. Yep, Derek Brown, Randy um, Cowart, Byron Jeremy, Cowart, Byron, Jeremy Johnson, four star. Oh no, yeah, four star. I think I don't think he's a five star. Jeremy Johnson. 
I the twenty four seven lie to me. He didn't pop up. Oh, he would have been in class of twenty twelve, would he not? Oh yeah, he would have been. But yeah, he's probably um, Nixon been. Papo over there. Nixon Papo. Uh shot in the dark, Nick Co. Nick Co is not a five star. Four star? Yeah. Or um, and look past the five stars. Let's see. I'm trying to think out it. It's got it. It's, I don't even know if they can be. I'm going to go ahead and tell y'all, unless y'all are doing deep cuts, like if you're not a longtime fan like yours truly, you probably wouldn't get a lot of these guys. Okay. Let's hear them. All right. Starting from 2013, Auburn signed Montrevious Adams and Carl Lawson. Those were such give me's. 2014, Rock Thomas and wouldn't Trey it. Williams. Trey Williams. That's what I would have, I should have got. 2015, Byron Cowart, who is listed as the number one all time recruit for the Auburn Tigers. Is he? Yeah, mm-hmm. he is. Number two is Derek Brown, who was in 2016. 2017, Calvin Ashley, offensive tackle, who uh, formerly got – a lot of these guys transferred. And then you got Bo Nixon on Papo. Yeah, so Calvin Ashley, Byron Cowart, Rock Thomas uh, are pretty much the only ones that didn't really pan out. You can make an argument for Bo Nixon on Papo being kind of – No, you can't. Jury's still out. Well, Bo Nix is already gone. Owen Papo led the teams and led, led, led his, his defense and tackles two two years in a row. Yeah, and I guess the argument is he was under, underutilized. Uh, I, I should know better than to try to do any slander towards Owen Papo because <laughs> I have a podcast with the Stan. <laughs> but yeah, I guess Bo Nix as well because he, he has like two stats that are in the top five all time for Auburn. Yeah, yeah. Bo Nix also, that's a whole other conversation for another time. That's an off season conversation, huh? It's off season. Yeah, okay. It's a deep off. It's a summer conversation. <laughs> it's a uh, month away from kickoff. Right. Type conversation. But yeah, Auburn got a five star, something we haven't seen since the uh, early stages of the end of the Gus Malzahn era. And Daniel, uh, as, as, as you as you as you know, since uh, Teldrick Falk was uh, named a five star by rivals, we've always said rivals is the best uh, and most accurate recruiting site. Unless on on three would have ranked him as a five star, then we would have said on three has always been our favorite. Or twenty four seven. Yeah. Twenty four seven. Or so, ESPN. Or yeah, yeah, ESPN. Uh, but but right now we, we can all agree rivals is the most accurate um, in the, in this depiction. Uh, I was actually, I mean, this is not that surprising. I think we all kind of thought Calder Falk would wind up getting his 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 fifth star. Uh, great. Continued continued to say this, but phenomenal pickup, probably an instant impact guy uh, for, for Auburn. Yeah, and I expect if 24-7 does pick him up, I know a lot of people kind of follow 24-7 more closely than a lot of other recruiting sites. But I think that Auburn's currently at 18th, and a five-star would probably shoot us up pretty close to that top 10. Probably not in the top 10, but pretty dang close to it, like 12. I don't think but it's going to move that much. Five stars carry a lot of weight. They do. I don't think it's going to move as much as you want. Uh, a man can dream. Yeah, right. <laughs> But let's go into another conversation we got to have. Tar, you brought this up on the rundown. The most anticipated returning players on this Auburn football team in the year 2023. Well, I figured we should talk about this one. Um, and and I, I did draw a little inspiration from Locked on Auburn. Um, and Zach Blackerby and Lindsey Crosby had a great conversation about it on Monday's show. Um, they talked about in extensive detail. Uh, uh, Blackerby mentioned uh, that, that he thinks that Jarquez Hunter set up for a lot of success this year, potentially a record-esque season. Uh, for, for Auburn. And I don't necessarily disagree, but I got to thinking to myself, you know, we talk so much about these transfer guys um, and, and Daniel, we've talked so much about these, these recruits and, 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 and I think freeze has done a phenomenal job, but there's a lot of guys on this team or a handful of guys on this team. I think that we're very excited uh, to see come back and uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and, 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 and let Daniel um, or Dylan, do you want to leave off this conversation? You had, you said you had a little laundry list here. I do have a little laundry list, but I, I know who you want to talk about, Daniel. I don't really know who you want to talk about, so I'll let you go first. Just because I can, I can skip over the one Tar wants to talk about. Um, obviously, big name Jarquez. Um, this will be his third year in the running back room. Um, first year not being behind Tank, he'll be the number one back. Um, and he's gonna have a full stable to work with him. So that's who I'm really looking for here. I think I'm going to build off that, if that's okay. And, and I'm going to talk about Damari Alston. 
so so I, I I I had a really interesting point come to my attention earlier today, and it was on Locked On Auburn. Like I said, I want to give Lindsay and Zach their credit where credit is due. Phenomenal dude. Shout them out. Check them out on all your socials. Jarquez Hunter is going to be the future back this year. We know this. Uh, we bring in Brian Batty um, out of out of USF um, to come to come be a good pass blocking, run block, even even run blocking for Robbie Ashford uh, back out of out of that backfield. Damari Alston quietly impressed the hell out of me last year. Um, when he touches the ball, he runs with power, runs behind his pads, and when you get him downhill, he's hard to catch. Um, I think this kid's very special. I think he's going to be special going forward. And, and let's not forget, Jeremiah Cobbs is not a spring early and rolling. So, and, and, and yes, he is signing. That is happening. Don't panic. Literally panic level zero. We'll talk about it later, Dylan. Dylan, I've, we're cool. Don't worry about it. Uh, but this is Damari's opportunity. Um, it's going to be him and Brian Brian Batty in in spring ball getting those reps. I think they go to Damari. Uh, and and I think that he has a really, really big opportunity to be the second head of that what could be a three or four headed monster uh, in in this in this backfield, and that's kind of been a flagship standpoint um, and and kind of I guess cornerstone of of, of Auburn football for the past forever. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of interesting opportunities there on the offensive side of the ball, on the defensive side of the ball. I'm gonna I'm gonna roll and let you go, Dylan. I'm just gonna build if that's okay. If you don't mind, I'm gonna cook for a little bit because I made a. I just I assume this was a list question. So, you know, my creative genius started uh flowing. Let him cook. So a couple of honorable mentions I have are on the defense side of the ball with Donovan Kaufman, who is going to be a captain of this defense at strong safety. And of course the big man up front, Thanos himself, Jeffrey Emba, who I love so much. I'm so glad he did not transfer. He gave me a heart attack for a second whenever he Came out that he announced he was transferring, and then he deleted the story, and then I had a panic attack because I was like, oh, I just put up a graphic. But yeah, uh, after, the funny thing about a lot of these players that are returning, like Anemai Pritchett, who I did add on my honorable mentions, but I thought about it, and Jeffrey Imba, their play and their impact got a whole lot higher, and my hands off screen, whole lot higher <laughs> as soon as Brian Harson got canned. Let, and, let me let me let me build off that just real quick, and then and it's you. I'm, I'm, it's a quick two second tidbit. I don't think anyone got better, progressed more than Nehemiah Pritchett and Donovan Kaufman, and and I'll I'll, th- I'll throw you that. But those two guys, they impressed the hell out of me. Um, that coming down the stretch, it's all you. I just wanted to throw that in there. Oh, as soon as as soon as Harson was gone, the defense started playing like a top five unit, and especially when you have you started giving Jeffrey Imba playing time. Why wasn't he on the field the first eight games? Where was he? Who was who was in charge? I'm glad he got fired. He deserved it for that because that that was a war crime of itself. Not having Jeffrey Emba. It's against the Geneva Convention. Exactly, it is a war crime. To keep Jeffrey Emba on the bench for more than half of the season. And the way I'm talking about, it, I probably should have him in my top five because I I I was fuming when that Mississippi State game came around. And I saw Jeffrey Emba get like. Two tackle for losses, a sack in the first half. I was annoyed. I was fuming. You ever play the what if game? If he would have had the same kind of rotational minutes, and maybe, maybe a certain uh, young man on the on the uh, on the defensive line doesn't get hurt, maybe by the name of Eku Leota, how much different that could have been. Hmm. The what I if mean, game is a very fun thing to play in the Harthen era. Eku Leota is going to be one of my biggest what ifs in Auburn tenure under Brian Harson. Like he was good. Don't get me wrong. Give you good before. What if <laughs> he didn't get hurt? Let's see. Uh, at my number five, yeah, I have Dark West Hunter. I think that, yeah, I think he's going to have a pretty great season. And you know what helps with a, having a loaded running back room? Picking up eight offensive linemen from the transfer portal and recruiting. And you're going to see a whole lot of new faces in new places. On this we think all line. eight are going to play. Yes, <laughs> I think the only start, the only returning player on this Auburn team that might see any playing time in the offensive line is Jeremiah Wright. Who's who's earned it? Who's earned it? Yes, I, I think he's someone that someone got mad at me because I didn't have him in my starting five. But I think he is someone that if you give Connor Lou that red shirt and give Avery Jones the floor, the center position, I think Jeremiah Wright retains his left guard position. I would agree. 
Uh, and my number four, I have one of my favorite players on this Auburn team, Mr. Camden Brown, who is uh, on my NCAA 14 dynasty at Auburn. He is the uh, leading receiver in all statistical categories, both NCAA and Auburn. Just putting it out there. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a big fan of Camden Brown. Uh, big body receiver, sneaky uh, sneaky fast. Uh, go up and get a guy. Love Camden Brown. I cannot wait to see a Hugh Freeze type offense on the Auburn Tigers because I loved watching AJ Brown play. I love watching Laquan Treadwell. I love watching DK Metcalf and Camden Brown doesn't have the muscle mass of a DK Metcalf, but has the size like height wise. And I love it. Uh, my number three, I have the corner DJ James, who I believe is going to end up being a top corner in the SEC. And I think could end up being having a good enough season to be a top uh, not top 10 pick, but a first round pick in the next year's NFL draft. I think talk he is, to him, Lark. Talk to him. If you like Roger McCreary, DJ James is the next coming of Roger McCreary. This guy is a lockdown corner. He is going to eat up quarterbacks. He is going to be someone that quarterbacks will fear to throw to this season. And I love it. Daniel, please don't hesitate to jump in and cut off Dylan like I have been because I'm just expanding and you're welcome to jump in. But I want to talk just two seconds about DJ James. Um, I've never been as excited about the secondary as I am right now. I've also never been known and appreciate uh, had the appreciation for a good secondary um, that I've had after watching two years of Brian Harson's um, tenure. But, man, you give this group some time to learn. And, and you give this group some good coaching that I think we, we believe are getting. Man, I'm telling you, DJ James is going to be right there. Uh, and, and we already talked about Nehemiah Pritchett and, and Donovan Kaufman. And you throw in the dogs, D-O-G-S, dogs coming in on this secondary. I dare you to throw the ball on Auburn. I dare you to throw the ball on Auburn. All right, continue. Sorry, sorry, Dylan. I got it. And let's not forget at the free safety position, we have another Wooden brother who is. Oh, God. Yes. <laughs> there you go, Daniel. <laughs> If you don't know, we are very high on this Auburn secondary, and oh, baby, it's going to be fun to watch. If you loved watching Jamel Dean and Carlton Davis lockup dudes, y'all got any more of those Wooten brothers? <laughs> well, we get we get into one of those Brit brothers. If you remember KJ Brit, his little brother got off way. Yeah, we get. You know, there's Brit. another Brit brother, <laughs> Daniel. <No! laughs> For those of you listening to us on Spotify, Daniel just went into full flex hype up mode because there's another Brit brother that just picked up an Auburn, an Auburn offer in the past couple of weeks. And oh, he's coming. Second, you already know. Speaking of the secondary, let's talk about the two coaches that are coaching up this secondary. One of them is Zach Etheridge, former Auburn guy. Dude is a certified killer. If y'all, y'all weren't around for Zach Etheridge days, this dude would lower his shoulder and kill you if you went over here the comes the boom and then on the other side coach crime dog wesley mcgriff i i think q freeze put one put together one of the best staffs we've seen in recent era i think that i if you look at the staffs that gus Malzahn put together i don't think it nearly reaches the name and firepower that q freeze just brought in I'm I'm fired up right now. I'm sorry. I know you're about to say. I know who exactly. You're on number one now, right? Uh, I'm about to say my number two is the guy you want to talk about. I just want to lead off because I I love me some Lando, and you know I do some Landon King, baby. The you watch you freeze. You know Evan Ingram popped off, became a first round NFL draft pick. It just got eliminated from the playoffs, but I mean it's fine. He popped off on the Jaguars of all teams. But let me just bring up the fact that Landon King. Is him and Tar take the floor? Landon King. Let me let me think here for a second. When I think of Landon King, I think of a dog. I think of a dog, Dylan. Now th- this this is a kid who who I am over the moon that Auburn was able to retain. All we heard throughout all of spring ball last year was buy Landon King stock right now. Buy Landon King stock right now. This kid's going places. Landon King to the moon. Lando, the, the space cadet. You name it, whatever the hell, it was there. And then all Brian Harson did was keep him off the field. And when he was on the field, you know, you know, all he did was catch footballs in the most dramatic way possible. And Brian Harson kept him off the field. 
this kid has the potential to have a very, very big season. And I don't give a damn who's under center for Auburn. He has the potential to have a very big year this year. And and I'm, I'm fired up because, I mean, I, there are some returners. We're very fired up about the people coming in, and rightfully so. But there are some guys that have an opportunity to make a, a, a big impact here at Auburn, and damn it, they've been waiting on it. And Landon King, you are one of them. Have you guys seen that Family Guy episode where Quagmire is flying him out to San Francisco and Peter um, Cleveland and Joe learn that being a pilot, since it's just autopilot, he's just like playing with Legos or yeah. <laughs> dressing up in costumes. And he's getting mad. So you're like, you're not working. You're just playing around. Is that what Brian Harson was doing? Was he just playing with Legos or he something? He was on autopilot, man. He, did, he didn't recruit. He, didn't, he almost lost so many players, but. Hugh Freeze got on that phone. He got Landon King back on the team. He got Zykevious Walker back on this D-line. Jeffrey Emba. Jeffrey Emba. On to victory, got that. <laughs> Down hey, whatever. Back. Whatever. I mean, I'm not saying I, – I don't – I love it. I love the retention of, that this team has had. The guys who weren't going to play are gone. The guys who are the dogs who are going to keep this team afloat with Landon King, who is going to be probably either the number one or the number two target. And if it's not if he's not one or two, it's gonna be Camden Brown and it's gonna be Rivaldo Fairweather, who we've talked about in link on multiple episodes, because this wide receiver core with that tight end, uh, Camden Brown, Landon King, and Rivaldo Fairweather make a pretty, pretty fun offensive scheme. But yeah, that was that was Tar's pick. Daniels was Dark West Hunter. Now, there's gonna be one guy who's my number one, who's gonna be the facilitator on making sure that Jarquez gets the handoffs and that Landon King gets the ball in the end zone. My number one pick for the most anticipated returning Tiger for this Auburn team, Mr. Robbie Ashford. I have been a truther since A-Day. There's not been a quarterback I've worn on the field more than Robbie Ashford. San Jose State, I was I wanted Robbie Ashford on the field the entire time. I was like, TJ Finley can't run. Get Robbie on the field. Mercer, I was like, TJ Finley can't throw. Get Robbie Ashford on the on the field. And I saw that Iron Bowl, and yes, it sucked we lost. But Robbie Ashford had one of the best games in Tuscaloosa that we have ever seen from an Auburn quarterback. And a loss, mind you. He had a great game against Alabama defense. Granted, not the best Alabama team we've seen in recent past, but it's still Alabama. It's and still, it's still the Iron Bowl. It's still Bryant Denny Stadium. A stadium that has cursed Auburn for – over a decade. We have not won in Brighton Denny Stadium since, since we had to back. have a literal superhero at quarterback. And you telling me that we have the next coming up of a Malik Willis type quarterback or as Lance Dahl compared to a Lamar Jackson type quarterback? A quarterback that just needs a little bit of help throwing the ball. He just needs a little bit of help. Get him some better accuracy. Get him some confidence. This dude can already run the ball. Give him the job now. Daniel, I'm going to talk about number nine, and then you can. T- I know you want to talk about number nine. Uh, yeah. Let me let me throw out a couple of facts for you right now, Dylan. I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to spit some straight facts right here. Facts, no printer. Fact. Robbie Ashford was not healthy all year last year. Fact. Under Brian Harson, Robbie Ashford was practicing hurt. Fact. Under Cadillac Williams, where we saw the most growth out of Robbie Ashford, he was resting during the week during practice. Just facts. Also fact, Robbie Ashford improved every single game he played in. This kid has got, and get, go ahead and get ready to benchmark this one, Dylan. I, I can already see it on the Instagram grid. grid. Uh, that's how conversation is getting quoted. <laughs> Robbie Ashford, with the weapons that are around him, the offensive line, all they have to do is be average. The backfield that he's been gifted, as long as he's given the keys to the Ferrari this year, Robbie Ashford's ceiling is Nick Marshall-esque. And I, dude, I know. Yeah, I I know. That that is, that is some lofty expectations. I love it. That is some lofty expectations. I get, I'm not saying he's Nick Marshall. Nick Marshall, I mean, damn it, that guy was one on one that year. One on one. I'd say 2014, he was statistically better. 
It, okay, come on. God wanted Auburn in the national championship in 2013. You can't change my, my mind. I, I, I was there for all of it. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, you were a little Georgia Tech fan over across the state line. Let, I let was me, here. Let me let me cook. So Daniel, Daniel's preheating the oven right now, and he's getting ready to cook. All right. <laughs> With the talent that we've seen out of Robbie Ashford, the passing game can be there. Look no further than the Iron Bowl. We know the running game's there. You can plug in the Hugh Freeze system where Hugh Freeze is not afraid to run that little bit of a read option. This ceiling is Nick Marshall-esque. I'm not saying it's Nick Marshall, but it's close. Daniel, Cook. I'm so excited. Um, last year, Robbie had no offensive line. He had garbage cans throw the ball, too. I'm sorry. It's true. And no time to do anything. Now, at worst, the offensive line's average. The running back room is arguably better. Tank Bigsby's amazing, yes. But we're bringing in so many horses, dude. I don't disagree. I do not disagree. So to, I think running back's better. Receiver, it, it can't be any worse. <laughs> the bar was on the floor last year. If the receiving core is somehow worse than last year, just we don't need to play football for a few years. Um because evidently something's just fundamentally wrong. And then just the defense will be better. There's just no way it's not. So you don't even need to do as much as you would have last year. And, oh, I just can't wait. I cannot wait until April, the summer. I can't wait until September. I could not agree more. And, and Dylan, this has been fun. This has been long, but this one's been fun. Yeah, that's probably been one of the top conversations we've had because – Talking about this football season, it, it might be one of the most highly anticipated. It's, it's the same thing every time we get a first-year head coach. It's always the most anticipated. It's always the most anticipated. First-year Gus Malzahn, yeah, went to the national championship, but it was – This one feels different than when they hired, when Auburn hired Brian Harson. It's, it's okay. feeling a lot different. I think the vibes might be a little higher. I, I know a lot of people are kind of questionable about the whole who you freeze hire in general, but you're choosing to ignore what he's built. And the short time, um, Dylan, as someone who would sorry to interrupt you, Dylan, as someone who's been through it, um, what can you tell me what the vibes were like in 2013 when Brian Hart, um, excuse me, when Gus Malzahn was hired? So, in 2012, as you most of you will know, Auburn went three and nine, vibes weren't high, uh, after that. Uh, Gene <laughs> no kind of took sucked the life out of uh, out of my day in and day out uh, life. I went to school with a lot of Alabama fans, it wasn't fun. But 2010, we had just won the national championship. Two years ago, we had just won it. And your mindset, my mindset was being, get him, get him out. I don't know who we need. And then all of a sudden, I hear Gus Malzahn gets hired. And I know Gus Malzahn's name. He's an office coordinator in 2010. And if you know the stories, Gene Chizik actually didn't want Cam Newton. One guy wanted Cam Newton. And begged and begged and begged, got him. We won a national championship. Rest of history. G, uh, Gus Malzahn wanted Cam Newton, and that offense was spectacular because of Cam Newton. But Gus Malzahn was the brains behind it. And getting Gus Malzahn back, we erupted with a day. A day was bumping. A day was packed. It was eighty-seven thousand Auburn fans at that a day. And I am fully expecting to see 88,000 at this A day because 34 commits in this entire class. I don't think I haven't seen that in so long. I'm I'm hyped up over offensive line. Who I we've never had a coach in my in my lifetime that I am familiar with. I had Tommy Tuberville might have. Gene Chizik, Gus Malzahn, Brian Harson did not recruit offensive line. Gus Malzahn's best offensive lineman he had at his tenure here was an edge rusher who is six foot nine, who he transferred over to offensive tackle in Prince Tech of Monaco, <laughs> who is now in the NFL. Might I add, he's in the NFL. So, yeah, but still, <laughs> wasn't even an offensive lineman out of high school. Hey, hey, no hate on my boy uh, Joseph Kristoff out of Madison, Connecticut. <laughs> True. Okay. But you had to hope and pray that some development came from this Gus Malzahn off uh, from the offensive line. 
But Hugh Freeze has it built. Ole Miss had great offensive line. Liberty had a good offensive line. I am hyped up for a good Auburn offensive line. I said it about Gunnar Britton. Best offensive tackle we're probably going to see since Greg Robinson. The best. This offensive line as a unit, you can say all it has to be his average is best. I find it so hard to believe that it just reaches average. I think average is the floor for this offensive line. Mike drop. I'm Harrison Tarr at by Harrison Tarr on Twitter. You can find my byline at the Auburn Daily, also at the College Loop. All of our socials are at the College Loop. Daniel, hit him up with your information. Dylan, you do it, and let's get out of here. At Daniel J. Locke, um, any Auburn student media outlet or the Opelika Observer or right here, you can find my stuff. At your boy, The Tank, on Twitter. That is boy with an I. That's ya boy, The Tank. Yeah. You can also catch me on the Auburn Daily Show. You're going to catch me on Wednesday with Mr. Harrison Tarr right there. Don't know what we're talking about just yet, but catch me on the on Monday's show. That's yesterday. If you want to hear me talk about Robbie Ashford some more, we talked about it for 20 minutes. I can't get enough of Robbie Ashford. Well, with that being said, it's been the College Loop Podcast.